we should get out of all these western alliances against china it's not going to help us at all i'm telling when the crunch come they will just leave you and go away because west is desperate and it doesn't want to deal with china directly it's so afraid of china actually let's be very clear about it and uh, europe has lost its ability to fight the average uh, age of the belgian uh, army fellow is 43 and his waist size waist size also is 43 so there is no uh, thing uh, left they are all uh, you known the pubs and uh, beaches and other thing they have lost the will to fight i am telling well china tried to project itself as a good friend and good partner to southeast asia and even built infrastructure in taliban run afghanistan it has also recently passed a border law which authorizes use of weapons along its 22117 km land boundary the adeptness of china in flipping the international outcry on covid originating from its lands into a sophisticated pandemic diplomacy with the sharing of equipment and medicines across the world was evident In 2020, 90% of the countries recorded negative growth, the most extensive economic recession in 150 years. Since 1990, China's GDP growth doubled to more than 30, 13%, while America's has halved to 4.5. That pushed China's GDP up from 5% of American GDP to 66% as it stands. Today, China boasts the world's largest financial reserves, trade surplus. economic me- economy measured by the purchasing power parity and even well the navy measured by the number of ships china's belligerence towards india in this context is quite worrisome to discuss this and more we have with us professor r vedyanathan thank you mrtinj and uh, welcome to all the infinity foundation audience i should uh, express my sincere thanks for providing this opportunity and uh, what i am going to say may be something what you may consider as contrarian or uh, not uh, as per the uh, generally accepted uh, discussion and uh, for instance uh, what uh, mrtinj was telling is all you know it looks like uh, you know uh, what one can call a uh, pamphlet provided by the us state department so <laughs> first point uh, we should be very clear about is our uh, knowledge of china particularly our i mean indians is significantly coming from reading the english papers uh, you know uh, like our financial times or uh, london times or new york times or washington post and all these things or the pentagon and uh, you know the so the you know the heritage foundation all those things and unfortunately we have never ever uh, understood china always through the western lens not through indian lens china has got something like 16 to 17 uh, india study centers all over china we don't we have hardly one i think if i recall in uh, jnu other than that we don't have many china study center and we we may be having I, my hunch is less than 100 people who know uh, mandarin in india so first and foremost point is we shouldn't too much uh, read china only through the western lens and then conclude of course we are genetically tied to the west let's be very clear about it our umbilical cords are tied to the west almost all the top bureaucrat judges and political leaders and their children and their sisters in law so that is the second point i, I would like Uh, india to look at china from the indian point of view for which we should have significant amount of understanding of china chinese society chinese background chinese fault lines even that we do not know what are the fault lines in china china understands indian fault lines very clearly india is a open system and democracy and uh, we have all the press and this and that and uh, it is not very difficult to understand indian fault lines so you stay here for from 10 days you will know what are the fault lines in india to adequately use it or exploit it china of course as early as 1967 spring thunder in the uh, indian horizon it told about naxalite thing and uh, other than that uh, for instance three gorges uh, dam was constructed roughly of the order of 10 million 
anywhere up to you know something like one crore people were affected and uh, significant number of people have also died during that uh, period i was uh, those days writing mails and other thing nobody used to bother any of that uh, why are we not taking any you know stand on this we never did that actually because uh, while well, mehta patkar uh, stopped our uh, you know this uh, narmada project for a period of 10 to 12 years actually we never ever understood chinese society as well as uh, because we think china means z z is not china one second is uh, we also think china is communist we are the only ones who think china is communist there are only three groups of people who think china is communist one is those who are sitting in the daba outside jnu you know that there is on ganga daba it is called i think and those people who are gossiping there they think china is communist <laughs> china itself doesn't think actually the other type of people who think is uh, this north korean and uh, you know indian think north koreans are communist north korean think i am so that is also which is uh, totally untrue and this remnants of cpm here and there like kerala and uh, other places yes. they think yes. let us be very very clear china is not a communist country or even a socialist country it is a market economy and they themselves do not consider themselves as socialist anymore so why should we think that they are that is the first point second is let us be very clear they are what i call ssp today what i mean is single super power whether you like it or not they are the super power west is on the decline let's be very clear about it and uh, china is a super power from yes. several dimensions purchasing power parity basis if you compute a global picture today china is number 1 us number 2 india number 3 and japan is number 4 this is the position on a global scale manufacturing output wise china is the dominant player in the manufacturing output in the world more than us actually in terms of gdp us and china combined together is roughly 42% us gdp is around 20 you know uh, something like uh, uh, 22 trillion china is around 17 trillion and i am telling you in another 3 4 year china will cross us even in nominal terms given all these you know this uh, problems of uh, covid and other thing china is in the same position as usa was in 1948 49 usa bombed japan after the second world war not before that's very interesting japan has surrendered and uh, the war is over everybody thought go home but then they went and quietly dropped the two bombs nuclear weapons us only had a nuclear weapon at that point of time shockingly none condemned us you go back in history and see all the newspaper no country condemned us yes. and there were a lot of uh, you know uh, discussion and other thing initially us was not accepted as a super power but uh, when the uh, nuclear weapon got uh, you know uh, made by russia as well as by uh, this uh, england france and other thing it became a balance of uh, what you may loosely call terror so by 50 51 us was recognized as a unquestioned super power then the marshall plan came and several other damn so similarly china has got a bio weapon whether you like it or not this wuhan uh, virus is uh, something which is uh, very very serious china has uh, got into this world and uh, their hold on the global institution is so much no institution including this wuhan uh, health uh, organization uh, who they have not uh, gone and investigated even properly one team went there and they were treated something like conducted tour they i don't think they even entered the laboratory still it is not clear whether it is spread through animals whether it was accidental whether it was deliberate no answers not only that china has the power and capacity to name the uh, virus not as wuhan virus or chinese virus but as uh, you know all this delta gamma gappa and other thing 
and this is the power of that uh, country not only that you see when uh, pig disease was there in japan it was called japanese encephalitis nobody blinked even calling it that name when the spanish flu was there it was called spanish plague when the ebola river thing came it was ebola but when the chinese virus comes it is called some delta or uh, omicron and uh, and there was some report i don't know how much it is true they don't want to even call it z they jumped actually in the greek alphabet anyhow the point is they are extraordinarily powerful today in terms of uh, international institutions and uh, international relation not a single country underline it single in europe or us has condemned china so far for this virus everybody and one idiotic group also talks in terms of some uh, you know indian variation african variation and other what variation it's a primarily their responsibility and uh, nobody forget about condemn asking for reparation they should ask china for a huge amount of reparation every country for the suffering which has been undergone and uh, roughly the order of 50 55 lakh human beings have perished actually in this so but china is a non challenge until and unless any other country develops a bio weapon of this nature to tell china if you want we can also yeah. inflict damage on you so it's not going to be easy actually what you call the mutual deterrence won't be there that's the first point the second is a uh, age old you look at the last 2000 years history there has never been any uh conflict between india and china nowhere in the history marxist history or uh, you know the saffron history you will read that uh, chinese army entered india india uh, nothing under various kingdoms various combination permutation actually you should know this uh, hu shi who is one of the great philosopher and thinker in china of the last century he was a uh, ambassador to us also from china later he became the vice chancellor of the you know the beijing university anyhow he in a speech in harvard he says in the uh, late 30s right. india is one of the india is a country which uh, occupied china china's mind and captured china without firing a single bullet he says this is something which is uh, phenomenal of course he later also says that uh, it is required for chinese to come out of the indian way of uh, influences and thinking we should adopt western way that is a separate issue but the point of what you want to stress is huge amount of indian influences on china when uh, shantay shaik left china and went to uh, what is now currently taiwan yeah. 14 ships he had he, he took away of that 6 uh, to 7 ships had only indian material indian artifacts indian uh, studies on uh, medicine astronomy astrology mathematics etc because large number of foreign ministers used to come through the sea route via burma in those days myanmar it is called now and uh, collect a huge amount of information from india on all these aspects what i want to say civilizationally we are very much closer to china compared to any other white nation but uh, again you know genetically we are tied to the whites if a plumber from new york who is a white most important he comes and gives a talk on economic there will be more crowd than a professor from iim in india indian economics i am telling later if you say the fellow who came was a plumber it doesn't matter sir he is white this is uh, we seriously think white man cannot tell lies and white man cannot uh, has to be right this is a you know this is umbilical is genetical you cannot you have to do some surgery only to change it so even if a chinese expert comes very few will this is something which we have to keep in the back of the mind absolutely our understanding of china has to change and china is not communist party or only z china is a huge society actually and i am telling you i have been to china several times so that's something very important to uh, mention and uh, they many of them have enormous amount of uh, love and affection for india 
and you know one thing yes large number of elderly chinese think yes. india is the elder brother yes this is something and uh, some of them have told me openly we have to take birth in india to reach moksha to, because it's a land of buddha according to them even today right so this is the one example i will give you recently in their uh, uh, people's liberation yes. army uh, video they have shown actually the bodies burning in the you know the ganges ghat or anything and adjacent to that a chinese yes. rocket going into the sky this was uh, juxtaposed to yes. show how much we are different from each other believe me sir this came in their uh, uh, global times itself in vibo ordinary citizens were very upset about it they told this is not the way to yeah. india is uh, our neighbor india so these are all after the so called uh, skirmishes and other thing which has taken place in the border yeah. they told and uh, the people liberation army in their website they have to remove this they told no and uh, ordinary chinese an enormous amount of appreciation we have never ever understood nor tried to influence chinese society right let's be very very clear about it china has got a tamil broadcasting in their uh, beijing radio from 1950 yes. all india radio used to sponsor to send people on uh, you know on uh, nomination uh, what do you call an uh, on duty without knowing what they were propagating and everything i ar used to send it we never had any such uh, arrangement or anything what we should have done we should have printed millions of mahabharata and ramayana of this uh, amar chitrakatha cartoons and then uh, distributed it free in china among the youngsters yeah. see you have to capture the imagination of the society this is very very important they have enormous amount of goodwill about us and positive thinking which we should actually exploit yeah. and we should identify their fault lines they never done that for instance sri sri ravi shankar aol they started uh, some uh, uh, this uh, yoga art of living yoga so much amount of enthusiasm and uh, participation we have never done that we should have started hundreds of yoga centers in china even today it is never too late right. and they will allow i am telling you the kanchi mat was supposed to go to china during yes, upa yes. time but upa so, government was very reluctant yeah. among the five religions recognized by china hinduism is not one of them first we must yeah. stress that point recognize hindu religion and uh, civilizationally we should try to move with the first point second let me tell it we have something like uh, you know 3500 km of uh, border with china and uh, you know a lot of people are telling they have occupied this first of all we don't have a line of control with loc with china we have lac only with china let's uh, distinguish between the two with pakistan we have loc line of control very clearly demarcated where they are where we with china we don't have a demarcated boundary line of actual control whichever is being uh, Uh, occupied at that point of time and uh, some of that is uh, occupied by them we claim from 1962 maybe true and they claim that uh, i don't agree with that they claim arunachal pradesh is occupied by india my point is the only point of uh, conflict is in the area of land yeah. which we should discuss see one huge portion of india is supposed to be occupied by pakistan but we are discussing with them we talk with them we have a diplomatic relationship with them we have import export uh, we have never declared pakistan as a terrorist every day they are sending some four fellows five fellows in kashmir and yeah. creating right so why should uh, we have not discussed with uh, china i am not telling that uh, we should ignore it or anything first point second point is having india china alliance will make the this century as the asian century right. real asian century the decline of the west is going to be complete and at this point of time we should become a appendix of the west in order to attack china there is a famous uh, saying 
the British commander, it appears at the Second World War, somebody asked him, will you be able to win Germany? Then he seemed to have commented that uh, we will fight the German last Indian. So that is uh, where we should be very cautious. We should become the fodder for this uh, propaganda of the... Because West is desperate. And it doesn't want to deal with China directly. It's so afraid of China, actually. Let's be very clear about it. And uh, Europe has lost its ability to fight. The average uh, age of the Belgian uh, army fellow is 43. And his waist size, waist size also is 43. So there is no uh, thing uh, left. They are all uh, you know, in the pubs and uh, beaches and other things. They have lost the will to fight, I am telling. Germans to some extent. So all of them are afraid of China, actually. Let's be very clear about it. And they want to use India as a you know, sort of a uh, hold on the shoulder to fight. No, we shouldn't bother about it, actually. We shouldn't go for that. China is technologically phenomenally developed. Let's be very clear about it on various dimensions. Whether we like, they started in the 70s, a bit earlier than that. We started only in the late 90s. They had a gap of 25 years actually. When uh, Deng Xinpio announced that uh, doesn't matter whether a cat is yes. black or white, as long as it catches, they completely altered their way of uh, doing things and uh, they have got their own uh, Twitter, they have got their own Facebook, they have got their own uh, what's happened, you know. Technologically, we are completely dependent on West as of today. As of today. We don't know. So, our software power and the hardware power of China put together can shake the world like anything and can bring a lot of peace right. to the world. Because uh, we can actually use the uh, Buddhist yes. basis, Hindu basis, and the civilizationally we should look at the picture, not otherwise. The old saying of this communism, they are all gone now. Absolutely. Civilizationally, we and China are together. So it is required for us to uh, look anew in terms of our position. Yeah, you yes, wanted to ask something. I was just, uh, you know, a few, a few interesting points there because uh, just for the uh, the viewers here, I mean, China today has five officially sanctioned religious organizations, um, which include the Buddhist Association of China, the Chinese uh, Taoist Association, there's an Islamic Association of China. Uh, One, two, uh, sorry? Confucius. Yes. So they also have the three self patriotic movement and I think the yeah. uh, Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association as well. Uh, but we do not have a Hindu uh, presence. We do not have a recognized council. Uh, and so there is a massive uh, void, a vacuum of sorts, which remains, I mean, in terms of um, the soft power we could possibly exert in terms of Hindu values and Dharmic ideas, which have, has to be looked at. Uh, before I move on to the next question, a small uh, tidbit, because uh, being a history buff, uh, Japan incidentally uh, surrendered on 15th of August, I think 1945. Uh, I think the bombings were on 6th and 9th. Um, so I think I think Japan surrendered a little after the bombing. Uh, on, yeah. Okay. They're yeah. very. Uh, in large, it was known that it is yeah. over. War yes, is yes. over. Uh, so in late May 2020, um, Chinese forces objected to the Indian road construction that we know of. I mean the Galwan River Valley confrontation. Uh, according to Indian sources, melee fighting on 15th and 16th of June 2020 uh, resulted in the deaths of 20 Indian soldiers and casualties of 43 Chinese soldiers. And uh, these confrontations, uh, along with those in Doklam and in the Sikkim sector, uh, seem to have been preemptive uh, as well as reactionary in various different uh, uh, incidences uh, by China in response to the Darbuk Shiok DPO road infrastructure project, which was happening in Ladakh and uh, has been going on for some time, as well as a revocation of the special status to Jammu and Kashmir, and a among few other geopolitical reasons as such. Uh, so following the Galwan Valley skirmish, some Indian campaigns about boycotting Chinese products were started uh, and action on the economic front uh, included cancellation and additional scrutiny of certain contracts with Chinese firms and calls were also made to stop the entry of Chinese companies into the strategic markets in India. Uh, so by uh, November 2020, I think India had uh, banned over 200 Chinese apps, including Baidu, Alibaba, uh, ByteDance, and so on. Uh, and amid the increasing clamor for boycotting Chinese goods in the aftermath of the Galwan incidents, numerous industry analysts warned that this, um, uh, you know, the boycott could be counterproductive for India, uh, 
may possibly send out a wrong message to trade partners and would have possibly very limited impact on China itself, since uh, both bilaterally and globally, uh, India is competitively a much smaller trade power. Uh, and we saw this, I mean, in by March 2021, for instance, uh, Huawei was back into the Indian market with a deal of about 300 crore rupees uh, from Bharti Airtel, uh, while other Chinese apps, including those that were banned, have been back in the Indian cyberspace as well. So considering the considerable economic and political strength of China, um, you know, is pragmatism, uh, you know, is, is measured, uh, you know, uh, stance uh, taking or assertive nationalism the path that must be prioritized because um, as we have seen in the recent past, there have been various nuances uh, to the story and uh, the realities as they stand. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> See, if you want to, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, what one can call boycott some Chinese thing in order to help the Indian, like your, uh, you know, Diwali time, a lot of these uh, small lights and small these things, that's, uh, that's, Nothing wrong about it. And, but otherwise, if uh, Indian manufactured or Indian made thing is not going to replace, what are you going to do? We are going to help only global MNCs. That's all. So a lot of American and uh, European firms are very happy about it. They would say to India, you boycott more and more Chinese. Yeah. Then uh, you can uh, take ours, actually. That's the type of thing. And then uh, there is also another... Uh, clamor that they will all leave China and then come to India and a lot of, uh, you know, they may go to Vietnam, they may go to Bangladesh, they may go to, and uh, it is not that, uh, you know, so many companies are uh, bothered about, you know, many of them sign whatever China says, that's all. China says, uh, you do this, they will, uh, whether it is Tesla or whether it is Google, finally, they because the Chinese market is so large, that is one. Second is, let's be very clear, China is not just a recipient. China is also technologically very, very advanced, actually. They are Hawaii and other thing. And a significant number of uh, you know, processes and products in Europe and US are uh, dependent on Chinese uh, uh, technology. It's not just like that, you know, you say China get lost. Or and the Taiwanese invest in, investment in China is also very large. There are very, very many Taiwanese firms which are working there. So just to boycott, you know, these are some of the, what one can call xenophobic or, and some of it is, I'm telling you bluntly, the propaganda unleashed by US and Europe in India. Yes. Again and again, I'm telling, be cautious. Don't be... Uh, Canon for our, uh, for uh, for the uh, these countries, yeah, yeah. in order to yeah. you know our relationship with China should be decided by us yes. and us only. Our interest should be the dominant uh, interest. Another thing. Again, let me repeat: globally, civilization-based uh, alliances are to be right. considered. And uh, another thing: China is the only country which has understood the Islamic terrorism. Right. Which we are not following at all. They say it is a, you know, openly they have told that it is a mental problem. <laughs> Islam has to be re educated and they are putting them into camps and other things. And nobody in the world is bothered about it. The only people who constantly criticize China globally today is this beyond network. The you know, world is one network from India actually, and uh, very few actually. I am regularly watching BBC, CNN, and uh, the Air France, uh, Dasha Wale, none of the global network is attacking China, <laughs> that uh, they are the originator of this uh, virus. Even for the virus, they are not, uh, they are very cautious in uh, talking about uh, China. So what I want to stress is huge amount of uh, uh, technological advancement has been made by China. Let's recognize that explicitly. There is no point in trying to, you know, they are right far advanced in technology compared to India, right? And uh, our GDP is, you know, some 3 trillion or something. They are somewhere near uh, 17 trillion. So there is no, you know, what I want to stress is no comparison. We have to have our hands clasped with them. What I call Russia, India, China axis. Right. Why Russia I am including? Russia will be a sobering effect on both right. China as well as on India. More important because uh, Russia has got good influence on China also. Russia may not be a great superpower today. Russia is actually a sub subordinate power to China. England was used to be USA today. 
position i am telling england and usa is same as russia yeah. and china so india russia and, and uh, russia has been a traditional friend of india for a long period of time including in 1971 war time we had a agreement with them and that uh, stabilized it as a picture much better because of that uh, you know us tried to send uh, one thing let me be very clear do not rely on europeans or white men including us they will ditch you they will treat you similar to the tissue paper you know use and throw that's all the way they treated this uh, afghanistan after 20 years you know they just quit that's all nothing happened iraq for instance they told they got huge amount of chemical nothing was found there no weapon was found or anything only thing is that fellow saddam hussein was thrown out and iraq is in chaos yeah. and crisis you think us bothers about it or europe bothers about it? the second is let us not be uh, what you call very great in terms of you know uh, carrying the good principles uh, globally the self righteousness of indians irritate many people actually throughout the 60s and 70s any problem whether it is uruguay or whether it is mozambique or whether it is madagascar or we used to offer our yeah. comments we were you know like sort of a, a big uh, you know like dharmic uh, global pracharak and forget about it nobody cares about you as bolton uh, enunciated very nicely in un india was taking so much help from imf world bank us everything 92% of the cases india voted against us in un what did we gain nothing we gained we were consistently attacking israel in the un for 30 years so i think we should bother about our interest that's all let's not try to like this uh, exporting democracy and uh, all if you china is not democratic it's not our ending it is the chinese people's ending and uh, we are democratic because british came and all that thing and uh, this is not the only way to live yeah today taliban is having they are also claiming their own democracy anyhow saudi arabia we have got a strong relationship nobody can accuse saudi arabia of being any democratic or anything so what i want to stress is exporting democracy is not our uh, major aim or anything. yes our internal democracy itself is facing lot of stress yes. that's okay and the self righteousness we should right. give up and this visho guru gusha guru and all nothing vada uh, pav nothing let's not be any guru or anything let me guru to ourselves primarily because if you go on teaching the world you know you should not do this nobody cares about you in the name of non aligned <coughs> everybody was laughing at you who cared about you we had so much uh, our self interest is primary for us If having good relation with china is going to help our interest according to me russia india china acts is yeah. will uh, galvanize the world will alter the center of gravity of the world will uh, declining west will be <coughs> put in it <coughs> put in its place that's all I think, okay. I think, you know, contextualizing it in the international, like internationalism, as it is called, it's become a buzzword these days. Is important, but more importantly, as you rightly mentioned, I think the self-interest and uh, what is best for India, and sometimes being Vishwa Guru or being self-righteous is not. Um, so carrying on with the idea that we were just, you know, you highlighted about the companies and the apps being banned. Um, so in an August 2021 investigation by Times of India, it was found that a number of these banned Chinese companies had put up new fronts and had continued to grow. Uh, for example. a uh, plate uh, which is said to be owned by uh, yuva dance internet limited i think uh, is actually owned by alibaba and guangzhou uh, nemo apparently yeah. so it was found that at least six of the top 60 apps in india today are chinese operated and together they reach about 211 million users per month and uh, these apps had about 96 million i think users in july 2020 uh, when the apps were banned so clearly there has to be a certain growth a spurt which happened of about 115 million uh, in the last 13 uh, months of sorts uh, and so three of these apps though what is very problematic and you know a little um, 
it goes into the territory of privacy and so on, which I'll be uh, coming to. Uh, three of these apps could obviously read items on the user's devices, access videos, photos, microphone. Um, most could track the user's location. And uh, our authorities um, uh, have not put out any report of a probe so far on the specific risks that uh, these apps bear. Uh, this suggests that the ban on the apps from a country that is deemed hostile was just an uh, arbitrary pressure tactic or a retaliatory weapon aimed at Chinese commercial interests more than anything else, it seemed. Uh, after all this. Uh, and this is particularly troublesome since uh, calling itself a pioneer in using big data uh, for what it calls hybrid warfare, uh, a Shenzhen-based uh, technological company with links to the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party is said to have been monitoring over 10,000 Indian individuals and organizations, uh, including the president, the prime minister, chief of defense staff, chief justice, uh, Lokpal, controller and auditor general, various chief ministers and cabinet ministers, as well as top industrialists of India. Clearly, prima facie, there is a case uh, to check if the reason that led to the invoking of the ban last year needs to be looked at closely again, and possibly going beyond in terms of, you know, the security, the sovereignty and privacy of Indians. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this? On this hey, first yeah. and foremost, 60% of what you say is are all New York Times reports. And all you know, whatever Wall Street Journal well, I mean, you know. other sources as well. You know, a lot of apps of uh, white man we are not bothering. You know, how much amount of this uh, WhatsApp what we are I am using, what type of data they have collected, what and a huge amount of this uh, data uh, centers are not located in India even today. Yeah. Yeah. They are all located abroad only. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as far as collecting information on our PM and president, I don't think you require a big apps or anything. Right. Even locally, you walk around and then you can find that much. We are, we are reasonably a very, very open society, right? You know, like uh, recently there was a car acquired for PM. About, you know, and a lot of this. And every aspect of that uh, car has come out. You know what it can withstand. In other words, if I am a terrorist, I should be. I have been told how to attack that car. You know, I should not use this. So we are a we are an extraordinarily open society. So there is nothing a big deal they are going to do about it. What I want to stress is, if you want to be very careful about data, and yeah. we should be equally careful vis-a-vis -vis the white, right, as well as right. corporates Absolutely. which are in. Uh, uh, from US, uh, from uh, Europe, and other things, as much as for the time. There is no point in only trying to say that, you know, uh, these uh, Chinese apps are all capturing all of our. There is nothing, you know, that's what I would say. Yeah. So I mean, but uh, there is this point that you have been ra you have raised in the first question and the second one as well. And I uh, do admit that many of the sources obviously are Western, and and you know we do bring a lot from that aspect. Um, but in terms of uh, awareness building and in terms of the presence that we want to see essentially, and and, and the knowledge thereof and the perception we create from that. Um, there have to be more practical grassroots level work and you know initiatives to you know facilitate that because as Brithija, yeah. I would suggest. I have been suggesting for the last 15 yeah. years. Create 500 China study centers right, in yes, India. Right, right. Yes, yes. In yes. every district, create a center. Yes, yes. <laughs> some studying culture, some studying. I mean, there is uh, Confucius. There is the language. Some studying, uh, you know, and then <laughs> make Mandarin available as an optional right, language. Right. Absolutely, there is no other way. You know, how many, when I have visited China, I was fascinated to know. <laughs> large number of study centers in yes. Hindi. Right. Wow. Yeah. So many of the Chinese are studying Hindi for the simple reason they would like to yeah. understand yeah. what is happening right. here. As I told you, there is a Tamil uh, broadcasting yeah. from 50s. Yeah. Yeah. We never, yeah. you know. So we should start with fundamental. 500 China study centers. Every Some of them, you know, it need not be everything extraordinarily super. Thing. Some average, low average. Some on music, some on culture, some on art, some on politics, some on economic, and exchanges. We must right, have. Right. Is it? And uh, ask Baba Ramdev, we have got this uh, Amuchi in uh, Kerala, yes. <coughs> Sri Sri, <coughs> all of them to open centers in yes, China. Right. As you right. said, you know, they have this uh, various other type of uh, uh, you know centers, Japanese and uh, Buddhist and uh, so let's let's uh, let's flood China with uh, our uh, 
type of knowledge and information and other thing. For instance, if you had a good relationship, this uh, COVID uh, this uh, uh, medicines are developed in India, we could have you know had a huge market in China also. They would have accepted it. So the point I want to stress is, we must create 500 centers at least in India of China study. Unless and until we have good knowledge of China from within China thing, that is most important. And uh, we are not going anywhere. You know, going back to London Times is telling this. London Times will tell so. Actually, I am very puzzled about something. When they write rubbish about India, this uh, Wall Street Journal or New York Times, many a time they write a lot of rubbish about India without any, you know, recently this uh, Karnataka government has some conversion uh, bill and other, again, coercion. And, and uh, they wrote, New York Times wrote actually as if it is, you know, some sort of a massive uh, war against Christians and all of them, every second Christian in India is getting killed type of thing. We don't... Uh, Relay or we don't believe those things. Yeah, I, but when they write something on China, we somehow accept it. I don't understand at all. Because let us be very clear, Western uh, media, in a sense, is a part of the Western uh, ecosystem. Right. To serve their interest. We have to be very, very uh, clear about it. So to that extent, we should uh, discount what is published on various of these aspects. I think, I think one of the prime examples which... I am not telling that uh, we should uh, have uh, immediate, uh, you know, sign a treaty with China or anything like that. To start with, at least let us not uh, try to uh, create uh, uh, unnecessary animosity. Yeah. So on 15th August, uh, we had a confrontation, uh, you know, outside uh, uh, the Indian embassy, uh, which was uh, after the revocation of Article 370 on, on Jammu and Kashmir. And um, there were about a few of us who had come together, I mean, roughly 100, 150 of Indians of sorts, um, who had come for a, a cultural program next to Nehru statue, which is there in, in, the, in the UK, in London. And uh, there was a plan Systematic way in which 5,000 almost, and these are there, there are news reports on that. Uh, 5,000 of uh, various anti-Indian, uh, you know, people, protesters, forces, uh, came together, and for four hours they were kind of, you know, uh, completely, uh, you know, throwing projectiles, tomatoes, all kinds of things. Uh, there were even people with daggers and you know various other elements which were very problematic therein. And you wouldn't believe it. There was a correspondent from BBC who came, and I saw her coming in with one of her camera persons, and. Um, she panned it around and I, I heard some communications that happened. Uh, she was like, oh, this seems to be a little a certain way because she obviously came there with a certain idea and what she wanted to project. But believe it or not, on Twitter that day, uh, they still went ahead with saying that the Indian forces, quote unquote, Indian people out there are the ones who are the problem creators, right? And it was clearly not that because we had school children, we had various other people on there. Uh, they had no interest in, oh. you know, I mean, so so that is how skewed, uh, you know, the Western media is. And I, I recognize that. Um, but coming back to the idea of you know, economic sanctions and, and what has been on that. Uh, Brexit was deeply problematic since, uh, you know, there were various statistics given at that point. I remember Boris Johnson and various uh, people, you know, speaking on this uh, extensively uh, because uh, the volume of trade that Britain had with Europe was significant and uh, the replacement deals or arrangements would be very difficult. Uh, and so when we talk about this boycott campaign, I mean, going beyond the rhetoric and jingoism that is happening in various places around, especially after the Galvan clash, um, you know, there's this whole, uh, you know, movement of sorts. But just to, for the viewers out here, uh, I would like to give some, you know, information on that. Um, you know, the pharmaceutical industry in India meets 70% of its active pharmaceutical ingredient requirements from China, uh, with imports from the country increasing steadily over the years from about 62% in uh, fiscal year 12 to 68% in fiscal year 19. Uh, India is dependent on China for compressors, uh, 30 to 35% of the total cost of air conditioners. China is a key supplier of sub components also uh, used in engines, electrical electronics, and um, you know tires in the automobile sector. India imports a vast portion of its solar modules from China. The Indian agrochemical industry imports a high amount of raw material from China. And even Indian stock markets were seemingly oblivious to this India-China tension that was going on. And inv investors seem to be appearing just dismissive of the boycott talk as just rhetoric, right? So while Make in India has facilitated a boost in the indigenization of products and solutions, you know, from defense procurement to retail and digital goods, are we really capable of getting rid of any and 
I mean, if at all, uh, you know, any co economic contributions to China, and if if so, how can we reduce the negative after effects of you know such unilateral nationalist? One of my uh, American yes. colleague, who is a very renowned uh, economist and finance yeah. man, he he once told me, not very uh, long right. before, he told me, see, India being a software power and China being a hardware yeah. power, if both of you combine, you will rule the right. world. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I would like to end that with that. Right. If both of us have some good relationship, we will rule right, the world. Right. Second is, in spite of all the big talk and other thing, I tell you, neither Europe nor US can uh, afford to boycott anything from China right. because their economy is so much interlinked today with Chinese yes. uh, thing. They may make noises here and there right. that you know this is to be. Particularly Europe, I am telling. Right. Uh, US may make bigger noises, but Europe will be. Completely, you know, Germany has made it very clear many times that our thing with China will continue. So that is where we are. So we are soft power, they are hard power. So we should combine. So on, on that, Thank you. I mean, on the political, geopolitical front, I mean, China has been playing a multifaceted geopolitical game, as we know, in Asia and in the world in general. And uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, or, you know, and it is co popularly called the New Silk Road, is one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects, uh, you know, ever conceived in the world, for that matter. Uh, the vast, there is a vast collection of development and uh, investment sub-projects, uh, which are there in from East Asia to Europe, uh, significantly expanding China's influence. Um, and even in, in our, the, for instance, the Gwadar port in Pakistan is under the operational control of the China Overseas Port Holding Company as leased for 40 years uh, from April 2017 as part of the Greater China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, also in Sri Lanka, uh, the China Merchants Port has won a lease of 99 years on the Hamman Tota International Port out there. Uh, so in the Energy Futures in Asia final report in 2004, it was said that China is slowly building its civilian and military infrastructure at chosen points on areas around uh, India, I mean, in certain locations, in islands, ports, and so on. And they called it the string of pearls, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, referring to the Strait of Malacca, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, the Maldives, the Strait of Hormuz, and Somalia. So now, uh, we isn't isn't this a fairly worrisome development for certain reasons? If we go ahead with the jingoistic uh, rhetoric that we have, uh, and and not go with pragmatism, and what is the possibility of uh, you know resisting what some people call economic, if not political, neocolonialism by China uh, as it's time? We are you know we are being foolish right. actually. Why are we joining this uh, you know Australia, what do you call Australia, yes. Yes. India, and? Uh, Japan and America thing. That, what is the interest in, for Absolutely. us in that? Actually, they are pushing us into, and obviously China has to protect its interest. Let me be very clear. It's a single superpower. In 1948 to 1953, yeah. what US did all over right. the world after the Marshall Plan and other, China, it has to safeguard its interest. We would, why do you want to create this uh, thing? Uh, what is that called? Uh, uh, America, Japan, uh, Australia, and yes. India. There the is quad, a. Is it? The, are you talking huh? about the quad here? Yeah, quad. Oh, what is that? And then, other than that, there is one British and Australia and America. Uh, the Commonwealth. Oh, ah, no, no, no. Only, Only US uh, yeah, yeah. and Australia. Uh, no, no. When you want to, you know, basically, let me, let's be very clear on one fundamental yes. issue. Europe is a declining right. power. China is an ascending power. Europe tries to do all sorts of things. Europe, I don't mean only Europe. Europe, US, Australia, all put together. The white man wants to maintain its right. position, which is not easy. And a white man wants to use India as a uh, frontline uh, right. fellow in this battle. That I think uh, we should not uh, get into that at all. We should come out of all these uh, things. Right all these alliances against China. That's not a good thing for us, right, actually. Right. Yeah. Um, 
so one of the things which you know various observers and this is i mean uh, one of the most important bits and i think this neatly closes uh, this uh, part of the interaction uh, is that of uh, how china's policy makers and intellectuals lay a lot of emphasis on what they call the huayu chuan uh, which is uh, basically discourse power right uh, though it literally means uh, the right to speak or the power and authority to speak and in chinese frameworks a country's huayu chuan is uh, essentially a form of power equivalent to military power and economic power uh, with discourse course as its carrier so uh, the effectiveness of this can be seen uh, you know in various instances so on 31st of may 2021 for instance during the 38th collective study of the political bureau of the ccp the communist Char uh, party of china cpc sorry uh, the central committee uh, <laughs> xi jinping emphasized uh, the strengthening of international communication to showcase uh, you know a, a real um, three dimensional and comprehensive china as as they put it and this sophisticated and modern expression of power has been very powerful on the international stage so for instance after china curbed political freedom as they say in hong kong uh, you know many western uh, media were all over the place about it a uh, united kingdom draft declaration of concern was backed by 27 countries but another commending beijing and issued by cuba 153 supporters uh, in 2019 when the issue of human rights abuses in xinjiang was brought up by members of the united nations human rights council unhrc uh, 22 democratic countries condemned china for its policies in in xinjiang while 50 countries including many from the islamic world defended beijing's crackdown right so for india discourse power has been especially been visible vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the contentious border dispute right given the breakdown in bilateral relations uh, in the galwan valley uh, there is a duality that comprises of reproachment by the chinese attempted by high profile interactions of senior leaders as well as calls for peace and trust trust building at the official level while engaging in this psychological uh, operations of sorts and china has tried uh, to um, you know bring forth uh, to use actually india's liberal and open media space i think you mentioned in the in the in one of the last uh, questions to sow dissent and doubt in certain places and that's the that's the reported uh, thing so as far as the galwan clash is concerned we must understand that no stone will be unturned left unturned to show that china has been on the right side of history and this discourse power and the soft power of sorts um, you know has to be looked at very closely uh, the indian government and civil society must create awareness shore up its defenses to push back against any such you know mind games as they call it um so what are your views as to how we can leverage our soft and hard power uh, truly make uh, you know uh, forays into establishing good and constructive engagement with the chinese first and yeah. foremost first and foremost mrityan we should come out of all these alliances which are opposing right. china it's not our right. day we should adopt what you may loosely call the old principle right, of non alliance right. why are we so much you know that's yeah. one second is you see 1962 or this recent galwan 200 years the british did uh, atrocious rule right. on india 45 trillion us dollar is the you know amount estimated to have been yes. looted we go and hug them <laughs> we smell their yes. perfume <laughs> and one uh, type of an incident or three types of incident adjacent to us done by china we make such a i i really don't understand indians at all right. somebody you know jalian wala bag was done by yeah. britain yeah not chinese yeah. Mm -hmm. have you ever asked for reparation from britain yeah. so i so, think yeah, you know yeah. i think we yeah. are we are losing the merit yes absolutely first we should come out of all these groups and alliances yeah. because we don't have the capable you know in maldives for instance there is a big agitation against india right. supposedly instigated by china mm -hmm. can you do anything like that anywhere in the world against china today we can't yeah. we don't have the neither the capability nor our understanding of fault lines of right. china solomon island very small island so much amount of anti china agitation took place near right. australia you might have yes. read about it that was supposed to have been instigated by taiwan i think we shouldn't get into all this you know if we want to again after creating 500 chinese study yes. center in fact do we know who are all the politburo members what is the type of relationship and other things right. do we do we think that only z is ruling the whole uh, 130 billion people not possible. possible yeah not possible there are so out of all these western alliances against yeah. china yeah. Yeah. it's not going to help us at all i'm telling 
when the crunch come they will just leave you and go yes, away high and dry yeah nobody is going to stand here right absolutely i think that is a very important point and i think the whole idea of cutting the proverbial umbilical cord and you know being decolonized truly decolonized in the psyche as well as in terms of being independent in terms of what we think is good for us um, which does involve also having a balanced approach to china to the east eastern uh, you know as you call it we should drive towards a century of asia uh, you know and 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 leverage that power that we can possibly have um so thank you professor vedyanathan i think it was a wonderful interaction uh, on china um uh, this neatly closes our um, comprehensive discussion might i say uh, on various aspects of economy of finance uh, on the deployment of technology in finance and uh, our increasing geopolitical uh, you know engagement with china and in the world in general um so thank you so much for joining us uh, professor vedyanathan uh, it was a pleasure having you here <clears throat> thank you very much uh, murthy i should thank you i should thank uh, infinity foundation rajiv malhotra as well as uh, vijaya for facilitating this